Hey, the more mics, the better this week on uh, the Baron Oil shows. We have Mike Grell and Mike Barron. As well. and, and for, Jeff is changing his name legally to Mike tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, you know what? I should say this. Not that anybody really cares, but I told Mike the other day I had blood work done about a week ago and I met this guy who had his name. Uh, who was really, he's about, one, I think he's like 21, and he just had his name legally changed to Badger. So, <laughs> uh, I just thought that was, but uh, if the place wasn't so busy, I was actually going to try to like FaceTime or something with Mike and let him and let him meet him, but the place was slammed and with a lot of sick people, and I'm like, I don't want to hang around here. So... Good That's know. hysterical. Yeah, yeah. It was uh yeah, and honestly, like I think he got rid of his last name too. I think he's just Badger. Just Badger. But wow. Yeah. So is there anybody named just Sable out there or um there's uh I, I met a fellow a few years back, showed me yeah. a picture of his new baby boy. Uh, yeah. his name was Jim Morgan. He named his son Travis. Oh, nice. Um, yep. Um, there's a, a lady wrestler goes by the name of Sable. Sable, but, you know, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yep. yep. That's cool. Can't tell you how many how many Olivers I've met. Oh yeah, in the last oh, I'm sure ten years. Yep. I'm sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so, hi, so uh, have you and Mike met before oh, at a yeah, convention or something? Oh yeah. I figured. Oh yeah, we, yeah, we've known each other since I don't know. Um, I, 16, I was skinny and I had hair. I was going to say the first comic days or before first comics. The first comics days. The first comics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mike Grell is well known to comic uh, readers. He's the creator of Maggie the Cat, John Sable, Freelance, uh, Warlord, many other titles. Many people don't know that Mike is a Vietnam War veteran. He served four years in the Air Force. Uh, he studied illustration at uh, the University of Wisconsin in Green Bay. Uh, so at one time he was a cheesehead, uh, and he's been stepping in and out of Wisconsin for years. So he's sometimes a cheesehead, sometimes not. But uh, Mike has left his mark on so many uh, titles, especially at DC, uh, where he he revolutionized Green Arrow uh, and brought to it a, a previously unknown. Uh, realism because of his familiarity with actual weapons uh and i think that mike created green bell the long green arrow the longbow hunters uh mm. and what many people don't know is that mike is himself uh an accomplished uh a big game hunter and has gone on safari in africa although whether to take pictures or take shots i don't know <laughs> probably a little if, about if you can't if you can't eat it what's the point <laughs> Well, I remember you telling me you were chasing some animal through the brush for hours. It was the uh, Cape Buffalo. Um, it was uh, my my second safari. Uh, I was in the Zambezi Valley, and uh, the the method for hunting buffalo is to get on the track of a herd and you follow them. Uh, if they run, you run. If they walk, they you walk. When they stop, you get down and crawl and make, try to make a stalk and get as close as you can. And uh, uh, we had found a, a herd with a massive bull in it and uh, uh, cut the track at 7.30 in the morning. And we, we ran on that track until 11 o'clock before we caught the herd. Wow. Uh, but but that was night? that was a long time ago. <laughs> Why don't you tell us how you broke into comics? I I got phenomenally lucky. I had been um, at the 1973 
uh, Comic-Con, uh, Phil Suling's old show in New York. <clears throat> and um, while I was there, Saul Harrison from DC Comics was reviewing portfolios, and I uh, left a portfolio with him. And as I was turning away, uh, an older gentleman, and by older I mean the guy was creaky. He had to have been like 20 years younger than I am right now. Um <laughs> <laughs> he, he stopped me and asked me to take a look at, at what I had in my bag. And uh, what he did, um, he told me in no uncertain terms to get my carcass up to Julie Schwartz's office. And uh, I asked if I could tell him who sent me. And he said, tell him Irv. It turned out to be Irv Novik, who was the Batman artist at the time. Oh, wow. um, and I walked in with the prepared encyclopedia salesman speech that goes, good afternoon, Mr. Schwartz. Can I interest you in this Lux 37 volume set of encyclopedia Britannica complete with <laughs> annual yearbook and calendar. And if you get interrupted anywhere along the line, you have to go all the way back to good afternoon, Mr. Schwartz. Yeah. And that's exactly how far I got. Good afternoon, Mr. Schwartz. And Julie said, what the hell makes you think you can draw comics? And I ended up my portfolio, put it on his desk. I said, take a look and you tell me. And you flip through it, called Joe Orlando in from the office next door. Uh, they put their heads together and I walked out half an hour later with a script. It was uh, Adventure 435, a um, Aquaman backup story. Um, and from there, um, I had just delivered my first story and picked up another script from Joe and as I got home the phone was ringing and Joe Orlando said uh, Murray Boltonoff doesn't know it but Dave Cockrum just walked off the Legion of Superheroes and uh, if he wanted to know if I could handle a, a monthly book and uh, would I mind if he recommended me for the job um and I, I said, sure. So Murray gave me a, a seven-page story to ink over Dave's pencils. And when I turned it in, he said, well, I've got good news and bad news. I said, well, what's the good news? I said, he said, you got the job. I said, well, what's the bad news? He said, you can expect to get hate mail. <laughs> I said, I haven't even done anything yet. Yep, yep. And he said, it doesn't matter. Yeah. For starters, you're replacing the most popular artist we ever had on the book. And to top things off, we're going to kill off one of the fans' favorite characters in your first issue. And he was right. <laughs> yeah, the, the mail all was on, on the order of Grell, you suck. <laughs> yeah, bring yeah. back Dave. Um, but um, that was it. I was off and running. Who wrote those scripts that you, uh, the uh, Legion of Superhero scripts? Terry Bates at first, and then Jim Shooter. Did that help you, I guess, getting that hate mail early to, to kind of start developing a thick skin for later? Um, I learned not to read the fan letters. That's yeah. Sure. <laughs> we were all lucky that uh, the Internet hadn't been invented in those days. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Yep, that's for sure. Yeah, because even if you don't read it, somebody else will read it and, and the yep. worst stuff and tell you. Yeah, yep, yep. You can yeah. run, but you can't hide. From there, I was uh, uh, doing a lot of backup stories. Um, did uh, Green Lantern and Green Arrow separately. Uh, the Atom was one. Uh, trying to think what else. Can't really recall all the little minor jobs that I did. Um, right. my, uh, one story that I did was, uh, I think it was called the alien among us. It was a science fiction monster, something or other. And it was, it was a, I think it was my, might've been my second assignment. Um, and Joe Orlando, who really helped out in, in those days for any young guy coming along, he would give them inventory stuff to do if he if he couldn't publish it right away he'd, he'd keep them working give give them inventory stuff and uh that one <clears throat> went into the desk drawer for two solid years before he pulled it out 
and published it uh, in uh, Weird War Tales. And uh, I've, I was I was appalled. Joe, Joe, please, just don't publish this. It's so terrible. And he says, no, I'm, I'm publishing your second story and Howard Chaikin's first story in the same issue. And we're going to give you guys name credit on the cover. That's never happened before. We're both going, please don't publish that crap, but no nope, yeah. name credit on the cover. Um, so, so there it was. Sometimes you just have to shake your head and, and grin and bear it. You know, nothing else you can do. Um, then at that, at that time, right around that time, um, Atlas comics came into the picture that Atlas was offering creator ownership and a hundred dollars a page. And so I took my portfolio over there and showed them what I had in my bag when I uh, uh, first went out to New York, which was a comic strip called Savage Empire. And it was about um, an archeologist who falls through a time warp and winds up in Atlantis. Um, so I, I pitched the editor on it, and he was really interested. He said, yeah, we want to do this for sure. And I said, well, do me a favor. I have commitments at DC. Let me get two issues in the bag before you make an announcement because I wanted to fulfill my commitments at DC and, and be ahead of the game. Um, he said, sure, no problem. Well, I walked from their office to D.C., which was about 20 minutes across town at the time. And uh, Carmen Infantino was waiting for me in the lobby. <laughs> uh, it seems that, that the editor had picked up the phone as I walked out the door to brag to Carmine that okay. he had me <clears throat> locked up. So uh, um, Carmine said, why didn't you bring it to us? And I said, you guys haven't had any luck with sword and sorcery type stuff at all. So number one, I didn't think you'd be interested. Number two, a hundred bucks a page and creator ownership, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and Carmine said, um, I can't give you creator ownership because DC doesn't do that. What I can give you, is our top rate, which at that time was $62.50 a page, which was 20 bucks a page more than I was getting at the time for pencils and inks. And uh, and he said, I'll give you a one-year guarantee, which is more than you'll get from Atlas. He said, odds are they're only going to last about six months and they'll be gone. Um, he was right on, on so many counts. Um Atlas evaporated in less than a year. And as far as the hundred dollars a page goes and the creator ownership, um, that lasted for about two issues and they dumped all the artists and replaced them with foreign artists who'd work for 25 bucks a page. Yeah. And none of those guys wound up owning their own material. You know, Atlas wound up owning the whole damn thing. So, um, <clears throat> he said, uh, why don't, why don't you give me the pitch? I'm walking into his office behind him, and his phone is ringing, and he excused himself for about three minutes on the phone call. And during that time, my brain activated and said, you dummy, if he buys this, you lose it. So in that three-minute time period, I jettisoned the concept of um, an archaeologist in Atlantis and replaced him with an SR-71 spy pilot who falls through the um, the opening at the North Pole and winds up in the world at the center of the Earth. I just finished reading a book called uh, The Hollow Earth, and it, it's all about the, the hollow Earth theory. And, <clears throat> excuse me. It's okay. You're coughing up, coughing up somewhat of a lung here. Um, I'm just, just coming off COVID, um, uh, recovering nicely. Thank you. That book, uh, spoke about how many different titles there had been, something like 87 different titles related to the hollow earth theory, 
that were published before the turn of the 20th century, um, in, including Jules Verne, uh, A Journey to the Center of the Earth, um, uh, and going on from there, the Ed Grace Burroughs Pellucidar series. And so it was, it was uh, at least a fair enough uh, public domain that I could draw on all of that. A Journey to the Center of the Earth was my favorite book as a kid. I read it like eight times in high school and saw the movie every time it would come around. Um, I, I think my last count that where I lost track of it was about 23 times I've seen that movie. Uh, the all of that movie, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, Pat Pat Moon is in it. Yes, um, <laughs> James Mason is the is the principal star. Come here, uh, duck. Come here, duck. Yep, yep. <laughs> and via duck, I don't know via duck. All of that went into the jumble. I I pulled stuff out of my hat, out yeah. of various bodily orifices, and threw it all together. Uh, I changed all the names of the characters. Except um, the villain, Demos. I still can't think of a better villain name than Demos. Carmine said, pitch this to Joe Orlando, and if he likes it, I'll, I'll give you a one-year run. So I pitched Joe, and uh, Joe actually had me uh, kind of stumped there for a second. He said, what's this guy's name? Because I hadn't thought of a new name for him, uh, the character. Uh, in Savage Empire... It's uh, Jason Cord, and I, I, I said um, Morgan. He said Morgan. What? I said you know, like Henry Morgan, the pirate. He goes, okay. So what's his first name? I said Morgan. <laughs> Henry Morgan. It's got to be Henry Morgan. He said, no. There's two actors using that name. It's Henry Morgan and Harry Morgan at the time. <laughs> My older brother had just had a baby boy and he named him Travis. And so I came up with Travis Morgan and he goes, Travis. I said, yeah, like the Alamo. He went, oh, yeah, that could work. That could work. <laughs> so um, uh, as luck would have it, oh, the, and the name, names for, for the, the places, Scar Taurus, uh, is named for the mountain peak in Journey to the Center of the Earth, that points the way the shadow of the mountain peak shines down uh, into the a volcanic crater and uh, points the way, the, the channel that they take to descend to the center of the Earth. Um, Shambhala, uh, Three Dog Night. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How does your light shine on the road to Shambhala? <laughs> Well, Shambhala is the, the golden city in Tibet, supposedly buried in a mountain someplace. Um, and and all of that stuff just just gelled, came together. And I had a, a ball doing it. Uh, I was a little appalled when I uh, uh, picked up the letter pages for the issue number three. And uh, turned to the last page, and I read The End. And I went to Joe and I said, this is wrong. You're supposed to say next issue and the title. And Joe said, Carmine canceled the book. I said, he can't do that. He promised me a year run. And Joe said, he lied. He does that. And uh, that was it for about two whole weeks before Jeanette Kahn walked in and canceled Carmine Infantino. It turned out that uh, uh, the warlord was her favorite comic in the line. And oh, wow. when she, when she looked at the, at the publishing schedule, she said, where's the warlord? And he said, they said, well, Carmine canceled it. She said, Carmine's not here anymore. Put it back. And that, you know, that made a whole career for me right there. Um, when the uh, DC implosion hit uh, everything that wasn't, Cancel became a monthly book instead of a bi-monthly. And that's how the war uh, picked up and, and went to a monthly book. Where were you living at the time? I, I, I started out in um, uh, upstate New York, a little town called Brewster, about a, an hour north of the city. But as soon as I 
had a reputation for myself and steady work. Um, I bolted back from my hometown in Wisconsin to a little dinky place about 100, 100 miles north of Green Bay, don't you know? Um, <laughs> so the, the, the cheese head comes naturally. It, it's pretty much in the blood up there. Um, yeah. A little town called Florence. It's a, a little known fact that if you're born in Wisconsin, you're required by law to root for the Packers until you die. Uh, apparently so. Yeah, um, my my family worships regularly at the the Green Bay Packers Shrine, yeah. um, in the backyard, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Uh, Talking to my brother one year during uh, the hunting season, and he was desperate to get home in time for kickoff. I said, you know, just because you're not there when they kick off doesn't mean that the Packers are jinxed and they, they're they going to lose. And he said, you never know. Married a gal from Alabama, so I'm down here right now. And uh, um, she's uh, she went to Auburn. So around this house, it's a war eagle. Um, uh, and you, yeah, uh, forget that roll tide stuff. Uh, even <laughs> though the, yeah, even though the, the Auburn team uh, doesn't have a whole hell of a lot of luck. They have a lot of support around here, that's for sure. Yeah. But I have to say, uh, um, Southern Conference, Southeast Conference, uh, is, the football down here is way better than NFL. I mean, these guys are really fantastic. Yeah. So who came up with the Warlord name? Was that you or was that someone else? Uh, that was me. Um, that's cool. It was another one of those. Uh, pull it out of the hat things. Yeah. There had been a, a Charlton Heston movie uh, called The Warlord, but it was two words, The Warlord. Right. And uh, I, that was in, in the back of my brain and um, just combined it and, and went from there. When I moved back to Wisconsin, I'm in my studio um, working on an issue of The Warlord. And through the mail slot comes this big package uh, from DC. And I had no idea what that could be in there. So I opened it up and it was the portfolio that I had left with Saul Harrison uh, of Savage Empire. And it came complete with a form letter rejection slip. <laughs> that said, uh, dear artist, thank you for your submission. Unfortunately, it doesn't meet our current publishing needs. Best of luck, editorial staff, DC Comics, uh, which was a real crack up because under the title, The Warlord, it was their top selling title. <laughs> right. <one>. Yeah. <laughs> what came next after that within your career? Uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow. Green Lantern. Green, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I happened to be in, in the offices when, uh, Denny O'Neill made the announcement that he was going to uh, resurrect that title. And I went straight to his office and said, okay, who do I have to kill? And he said, if you want the job that bad, just put the gun down and it's yours. Not, <laughs> not really, but right. Yeah. To that, yeah, to, to, to that effect. Um, and uh, I, that was a, a stroke of luck because Green Lantern, Green Arrow was the title that got me interested in comics in the first place. Uh, I had been stationed in Saigon uh, in 1970 when a fellow came from the States carrying a small stack of his favorite comic books. And in there was that run of uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow by uh, Neil and Denny and Dick. And it blew my mind. I had gotten away from comics in my teens. You know, I was hung around long enough to get the early Marvel stuff, you know, all that stuff under the bed in a box when I went off to college and since long since sold for scrap paper, really. Yeah. I had missed that whole evolution, the 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 late sixties altogether. And uh, it floored me that here were stories about real issues in the world today and it beautifully illustrated and i decided right then and there that that was the kind of work i wanted to do right place right time 
and um, you know, I'm really grateful for it. I had a, I forget how many issues I've, I've done uh, of that title, but uh, most recently went back and uh, did um, anniversary stories uh, for both uh, Green Arrow and uh, Green Lantern and Green Arrow, um, which turned out to be Denny's last story. I remember reading the script, and when it came to that last panel, and he had written the end, I knew he was trying to tell us something, and a few months later, he was gone. Just like that. Wow. Life short. Yep. Mike, how did you get involved with First Comics? Uh, I had I had known Mike Gold uh, from when he was uh, doing PR for DC Comics, and um, he was also uh, one of the co-founders of the Chicago Comic Con, and uh, we always got along famously. And uh, when he jumped ship from DC and became one of the founders of First Comics, he called me up and offered me carte blanche anything i wanted to do any subject matter just wanted me to write and draw a book for first and so uh i came up with sable uh for uh, a number of reasons one was that um i was tired of doing superhero books i just uh, muscle ball guys in skin tight suits had gotten uh, old and, and boring for me. And uh, I had a I had another comic strip that I uh, made an attempt at trying to sell once upon a time called Iron Mike, um, a hard-boiled private detective kind of thing. And I took a few elements of that and combined it with um, the African background, uh, made him a professional hunter, and the reason for that was to give myself something that I would be so interested in, it would bring out my best work. And I started doing stories that were grounded in reality, um, uh, which I continued to do through my run on uh, Green Arrow later on. Um, and so I, you know, I, I just wrote the kind of stories. I've, I've, always, I've always written for an audience of one. I, I write for me. Um, but it just happened to be lucky that I'm apparently in a, a wide demographic. Uh, yeah. You know, it has a, a strong appeal to guys like me, and uh, I had a, a great time on that book. It's one of the one of the best things I've ever done. Were, were you already um, doing hunting and everything before that, or did that come? Oh, yeah. Where, where I grew up in northern Wisconsin, during the Kennedy administration, they did um, an assessment of the 10 most depressed areas in the United States. My hometown was tied for first with Appalachia. Wow. wow. There, was, there was no industry. The mines had closed down. Um there was there was just nothing. Um, uh, fortunately, my dad was a lumberjack and and was was never really out of work. Um, but in those days, if your dad didn't hunt, the family didn't eat meat, and that's all there was to it. Uh, my mom grew up uh, in that kind of a, a lifestyle too. When when the TV was on and you'd hear the theme song from the Walton start. But da 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 from the other end of the house, you could hear my mom yell, "The Waltons were rich." <laughs> <laughs> uh, but mom, mom hunted. You know, taught. She was the one who taught us the fast way to skin a rabbit, uh, things like that. And uh, so I grew up <clears throat> running wild in the woods, really. Um, uh, a lot of times wearing a loincloth and yelling like Tarzan. Um, and I hunted from the time I was able to. It's just part of the heritage and, and part of the, the lifestyle living in that era. Now, I will say that during the time that I was hunting, um, I once went 10 solid years without firing a single shot in the woods. 
because wow. and just just luck of the draw. But during that ten year period, I had a squirrel come down a tree, sit in my arms, and eat a pine cone. I had my arms crossed with my rifle pointing up like this. He sat right there uh, on top of my rifle and and ate a pine cone. I had a whole flock of chickadees land on me one day. They were they were flitting from bush to bush as I was walking down a logging road, and uh, I decided to just hold still and see how close they would come. And the next thing I know, I've got about fifty chickadees all over me. They were out out the end of my gun barrel. I I had one little guy landed on top of my hat. He hopped down in the back, and I feel him trucking around. He walks around to the front. Pretty soon, I see feet grab hold of the brim of my hat. <laughs> And he was like this, looking me right in the eye. I I lost it. I laughed, and and they just exploded and took off. I had a I had a rabbit come uh, hopping down a trail once. I was standing next to a tree in a patch of sun on a really cold, bitter morning, and uh, he comes hopping down the trail, right next to my leg. He stops, turns around, uh, sits down facing the same direction I was and leaned up against my leg to like, to get warm. Like we were just sitting there waiting for a deer to come along and here comes this rabbit. Um, you know, th things like that. I had, uh, um, uh, an urban phase weasel I'd go under a hollow log where I was sitting, um, and, uh, hopped up, came back the log on top of the log next to me and, stood up about three feet away looking around to see if there was anything to, to eat, and then off he went. I had a turkey try to land on me while I was in a tree stand once. And uh, all of those all of those experiences I never would have had if I hadn't been in the woods carrying a yeah. gun as an excuse. Um, it's just, you know, something that, that I, I really love being in the outdoors. And and being able to incorporate incorporate that kind of stuff in Sable, I think, was what really brought out the best in that book, best in me. Yeah. How many issues of Sable did you do? I don't know. <laughs> you ran for years, right? Yeah, 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 ran for years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think I think I wrote and drew fifty seven before I left the book. Um, and the reason I, I left was, uh, um, money dispute with, uh, first comics. They were simply not paying the royalties that they were supposed to. And, uh, royalties? The, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, at, at one point, at one point they were almost $60,000 in the hole to me. Um, and I, I realized that if I stayed with them, it was just encouraging that kind of bad behavior. Uh, the contract that I had um, for Sable and, and for Star Slayer said that um, it was for a 10 year period or for three years after they stopped publication. And I knew that if I left the book, the publication would fall apart in fairly short order. And and I was right. Uh, once I was gone, uh, they handed it off to a couple of different artists. Dennis Cowan was one. Dennis was a terrific artist. I mean, just an amazing artist and a great guy. Um, but without my imprint on the book, without my personal hand, uh, it it fell on hard times, and uh, they stopped publication. And, and three years later, I got the rights back. A lot of people don't know that there was a Sable television program. Yes, there was, ever so briefly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it lasted, well, um, I think the second episode was on when the phone rang and the network canceled it, uh, and, and for, for very good reason. Um, my, my concept on Sable was that he's a reverse of Batman. No secret identity, none of this by day, the mild mannered show on the bike by night, the dark Avenger. Uh, so they reversed my reverse and made it exactly like Batman, 
Yeah. By day, the mild-mannered children's author living with a secret identity, and by night, the dark Avenger. And it's like, no, guys, you don't understand. Um, they, they did a, a test audience. Demographically, it was ranked number one in the 18 to 35-year-old male market. So when did they put it on? Eight o'clock on Saturday night. Guess where your whole demographic is? They're not sitting home watching TV. We started off selling um, Coors beer and Dodge Ram four-wheel drives. And two weeks later, we were selling Calgon and Ritz crackers. It was <laughs> it was just terrible, terrible. Uh, they, they tried to uh, revise the show um, with the fourth episode, and it, it, it just didn't come off. But Rene Russo made her acting debut in that series, uh, played Eden Kendall, and so did Laura Flynn Boyle. Oh, I wow. didn't realize that until years later somebody pointed it out. Um, she played a, a little girl who was kidnapped in the, in the pilot episode. Has there been any other interest or anything in any of your other properties? Oh yeah, there 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 has been uh, quite a bit uh, over the years. Um, I had a, a an option for a sable film uh, in two thousand, um, and the uh, the un unfortunately um, there was a SAG strike. Right. Uh, pretty much scheduled. You know, everybody assumed that the contract wasn't going to go through. And so uh, in order to get into production, uh, it would have to be uh, greenlit by uh, March 15th. And uh, uh, they took a look at the screenplay and they, they felt that it was about 90% there, but they wanted to do some tweaking and rather than rush uh, into, into production, they figured we'll just hold off and uh, uh, do the start shooting in October, which would have been ideal for the, the nature of the story. Uh, unfortunately, 9-11 happened, and when the, when the Twin Towers came down, um, the producers lost all their foreign capitalization. Yeah. And, you know, they got the rights back and turned around. It actually is being looked at seriously right now streaming services are just dying for content at the yep. moment um i've written a a screenplay that is is getting some play and uh have high hopes for it um uh, maggie the cat as well maggie was a, a spin-off character from the sable series uh, she showed up uh you know i think issue number 16 um and uh, she's she's basically uh, a lady cat burger, but uh, she was always one jump ahead of Sable. I always like the idea that the 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 hero who's been invincible uh, winds up getting his ass kicked by a woman. You know, it's yeah. just you yeah. know just about just about the time when uh, he's been established and everybody's settling in, and they just automatically assume that he's going to be able to overcome all adversity and come out on top. No, no, she's, she's a jump ahead of him and, and, uh, always, always winds up the winner. Um, I revised that character and, uh, uh, give her a new backstory where she is the, um, widow of, a landed British gentry type. Uh, he's got a, a title of Lord Grimalkin. And uh, so th th that makes her Lady Margaret. And what I was going for is the, the idea that she marries this guy thinking she'd have sort of a Princess Grace kind of life. And instead she winds up more like Princess Diana or Meghan Markle with the press hounding her to death and a, a cheating philandering husband who kills himself in a car wreck with his latest mistress leaving her penniless except for um, a, a ramshackled ruin of a castle in uh, Scotland and a stone gatehouse that she's running as a bed and breakfast. And uh, with the aid of her 
uh, trusted butler, uh, Angus McAllen, who's a, uh, uh, an old rep reprobate. He's, uh, he had been a stage magician, uh, who, who couldn't make it as a magician. So he started using his lock picking skills to crack safes instead. And, uh, he's been training her in more ways than one. He's uh, Higgins to her, Eliza Doolittle. He's smoothing off the rough edges while he's training her to be the, the, the greatest cat burglar in the world. And unfortunately for her, British SAS gets wind of what she's up to. And they press her into service to uh, help track down a terrorist mastermind, uh, a creaky old guy who's a, a leftover Nazi from the Hitler youth, who's now into his early 90s. And he's going to be dead soon. He sees no reason why the rest of the world should outlive him. And uh, so she's she's teamed up with uh, a top British agent, uh, an SAS asset, to um, uh, ferret this guy out and uh, bring him to justice once and for all before he can pull off his big shtick. We ran two issues of that before the industry collapsed. Uh, recently went back and added, there you go, and added more um, more material to that two issue story added another 15 pages that uh, bridges the gap between the first and the second issue and uh, fills in um, continuity. So it will match uh, what's in my screenplay. And uh, we're just getting ready to launch a new Kickstarter to fund the second ish, the second volume of that where the whole story will wrap up. Did you ever do any novels on John Sable? Or I did. I, I uh, published a novel uh, in '99, uh, <clears throat> and I have a second right. one in the works um, that leapfrogs um, a, a good deal, uh, brings it um, um, very much into the uh, 21st century, uh, and and reveals some interesting stuff about his uh, background and, and his family. Um, cool. I think, yeah, I think you guys will like it. Do you have a publisher? Uh, on, on that second one, I'm, I'm going to self publish to begin with. Do you intend to continue that series if it works? If it works? Yeah. Yeah, I will. Uh, I want to want to at least get that, get that second book out because there is a, a, a bit of a cliffhanger, uh, at the end, uh, you, you, it, it's never a good idea to be absolutely definitive. Although um, in the first novel, I was quite happy to leave it where I did. Um, I'm not going to tell you how that one ends, but uh, it's uh, it's a bit ambiguous. Uh, if if I never did another story, I would be content with that story right. is a standalone and you can read it and, and not feel like you're missing anything. Mike actually had two successful Kickstarters with the Nexus novel and a Badger novel. Yeah. So, which I, I, and I, it, which is tough to do. It's tough to do what, to do decent with a novel, but like if you have a character like, like John Sable or Nexus or Badger that people know, then yeah, definitely. I, I would imagine I, um, writing a, a Nexus novel would be tougher than the Badger. Because yeah. the bad badger seems to me it's it's all in the character, yeah. Um, sort of um, uh, not not stroking your ego, Mike, but uh, uh, Elmore Leonard uh, type uh, dialogue back and forth is you know you can you can tell tons in dialogue and uh, yeah. Nexus seems to me that it would be more visual. He went a little crazy with the Nexus novel. It's it's pretty. What Mike went crazy? Mike went crazy. Really? I know it's so. It's not like him. I have no. another one that's that's almost finished, and I just haven't been able to get to it because I'm so busy with other projects. Yeah, he actually did. I mean, I I mean, I haven't heard all of the responses, but he he, from what I had seen and read too, like he he got a lot of people really liking it. So um, I know you you had um like a lot of us, you had trouble with your last um, Kickstarter and. And, and nightmares with the oh lordy everything yeah. 
Um, because <laughs> with, I mean, just, I mean, stuff we, we don't think about, like, like being able to have paper available for people to print on. And it's like, who to thunk it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, like, wait a minute. There's no paper. Yeah. 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 Uh, or, or there is paper, but it's on the other side of the world. Yeah. And getting it from there to here. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just, uh, I, I, I can't believe how many obstacles there turned out to be in oh, something yeah. that you would think it would be just simple. Step right. one, step if, two, step if three, they step four. Hemp, we wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> why, why, <laughs> why is that going to fix it? Well, because hemp grows real fast uh, uh, as opposed to a tree. I mean, you can plant a crop of hemp and within a year it's paper ready. Oh, wow. So you get a, a crop of, of you get paper every year from the same field. Yes, but after you roll it up and smoke it, <laughs> that, can you still print on it? No. Well, it's it. You get it, it, you get multiple uses out of it. Uh, it? Yeah, you can do a lot yeah. of hemp. You could can can probably. Do you do toilet paper too, Mike? With hemp? No, but I can do the socks. Oh, okay. <laughs> No, I I, I, <laughs> I I don't want to get into the, the image that that just conjured up. Oh my god! I'm not joking. I have hemp socks. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just picture you, you know, pulling the sock over. Never mind. Yeah, my head, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I know you had mentioned you were trying to get back um, back on track with all that stuff. Um, and I know you have the Maggie the Cat thing going, but is there, did you, were you, did you say that there's uh, like whatever, like the John Sable Freelance? The Omnibus. Yeah, um, the Omnibus. Yeah, yes, we, we finally have that going to the printer. Yep. Uh, well, I think what we're seeing now in terms of film and television is that the guys who grew up reading comics are now in charge of stuff like that. Yeah, you know, where you, you used to have to spend hours trying to educate someone on the the how and the why and how this works and how it can um, be um, capitalized on uh, down the road. You don't have to do that anymore. Everybody seems to get it. Um, yeah. Sometimes not. Dogs are different. agitating for dinner. They can they can just wait. They can just wait. <laughs> Get the dogs will be fed. The dogs have never gone hungry. They're, they're probably trying to uh, go to Mike Grell for because of his uh, animal magnetism yeah. he has. <laughs> Mike, are you doing <laughs> continuity these days? Uh, yeah, yeah, I what am. Are you um, I've, I've got the the second uh, Maggie the Cat uh, right. book. Right, that right, I'm, right. Yeah, um, I've you know, completed the script on that and. Um, going to be uh, launching into the artwork here very shortly. Um, You're going to crowdfund that, right? Yep. 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 How yep. long, how big will the book be? Uh, the The second one is going to be, um, it, it's planned for uh, 64 pages total. Uh, it's going to be uh, 48 pages of a new continuity and then lots of backstory behind right. the scenes stuff. The, um, is it, are, are you going to do the same, um, kind of like combination of, uh, like art styles with, uh, like pencil and ink and are you coloring it yourself? Are you painting any of it or anything or, uh, no, the, 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 the coloring, I, I leave to the pros on yeah. a book like that. Um, I can, and I have uh, done it in in the past, but yeah. uh, it's it's better. My my time is better spent if I yep. stick to other things. The experimental stuff that I did with uh, the Green Arrow, the Longbow Hunters. You now a lot of those panels were uh, drawn in in pencil on colored paper and hand tinted, hand painted, uh, and I I was really experimenting, pushing the envelope as much as possible uh, to see uh, what I could get away with. Um, Maggie the cat is um, all done pen and ink. Right. Uh, Sable 
is done 90% from reproduced from the pencil. And that, that's something that I started doing back with issue number 19 yeah. of Sable. Um, I just, I've, if I had to throw everything away in my studio and keep one tool, it'd be a pencil. That, yeah. That's all there is to it. Uh, and today with the quality of scanners that are available, things yeah. you can do digitally, I can, I can pencil a page tight enough that um, in 10 minutes, I can take it from a pencil page to something that looks like it's been inked yeah, uh, yeah. and, and add in um, certain things in the, in the background that uh, I can't get uh, with, um, I can't get it with uh, pen and ink, but you can do it with pencil. Um, are lucky that way. Uh, it takes about, it takes maybe 25 or 30 percent more time to pencil, but then you save nine, 10 hours a page on inks. Right. So yeah. know, it's, it's just a phenomenal savings. When you did like the longbow hunters and you were being experimental, were they pretty supportive of that? Um, like d at DC and the editors or, or the, the people or, or were they like, once again, did they fight I, you a I, little? <laughs> no, I once again, I I had Mike Gold firmly in my corner. Uh, yeah. Mike had left First Comics uh, when they when he was became aware that their business practices were detrimental right. to the creators, and I uh, went back to DC, yeah. and once again, he called me up and basically offered me carte blanche. Yeah. On on Green Arrow, naturally we had to pass everything through um, the the higher ups in order to get approval. Right. But uh, it was always filtered through Mike, and uh, Mike was great at getting things done. Um, we pushed the envelope as much as possible on that book, and I've, again, I was taking stories out of the headlines, and right. there were. There are a few that uh, got some uh, critical pushback, um, but for for some reason, um, people I, I had a, a reputation there for a while of being a misogynist. Nothing can be further from the truth. Um, I I not only have the greatest respect for women, I. I grew up in a family of uh, three boys plus dad and my mom, and mom ruled the roost. Uh, there's just uh, no two ways about it. Uh, strong, independent women uh, are are really the only kind that I'm interested in. Uh, when you meet my wife, you'll understand. Mary is just an amazing gal. The storylines that, that we did, for instance, there was one that dealt with... Uh, um, human trafficking um, in the sex trade uh, the, based on a, a true story of, of a girl from Canada who was sold into the sex trade by a biker gang. They shipped her down to Florida, and when she tried to break away, they crucified her, make, a, make an example of her. Right. Um, and we did that story. Uh, when, when, I wrote, when I wrote it, Mike took it to Dick Giordano, who was creator director at the time. In fact, he had another title. I can't remember exactly what it was, but he was basically the boss. And uh, he said, uh, what do you think we ought to do with this? And Dick said, push the envelope. And it right. helped that Dan Jurgens was the penciler, but Dick was the inker on that. Oh. And yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that one, that one got me one of my favorite reviews of all time. Um, it was uh, mentioned in um, New York Times and Time Magazine uh, in the same week. I did a feature on, on comics, and uh, they refer to it as borderline pornography <laughs> pandering to the prurient interests of today's youth. Like, you can't buy publicity yeah. like that. I mean, that that's just fantastic. We have Mike Gold lined up for an interview. 
Yeah. Uh, there you go. Um, yeah, he, he's a he's a, a great guy, smart as a whip. He's been there and done that. Uh, you have to ask him for some of the stories from before he got into comics. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm, I've been after this guy to write his memoir for the last 20 years, and yeah. he's dragging his feet. I'll get on his case, too. There you go. There you go. The Chicago days. Yep. The, the the Chicago days are, are really something, but so um you know we we pushed the envelope uh, every chance we got and uh, made it a point uh, to tackle hard issues that people would ordinarily shy away from. Right. Um, basically, um, I don't know. Uh, it's if if you don't give a damn, they can't hurt you, right? Right. Um, and, and that was that was kind of our attitude through the whole thing, and uh, I was just phenomenally lucky to have the backing and support of these great people that I've worked with over the years. Is there somewhere um, online that you'd like people to uh, hunt hunt you down? Yeah, you can uh, 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 check out my website, uh, mikegrell dot com. That's yeah. an easy one. Um, there is an authorized. Mike Grell page on Facebook. I don't do Facebook, but yeah. uh, it's administered by Jeff Messer, who is uh, editor of my Master Stroke Studios imprint. And uh, we um, um, keep people as up to date as possible on that. And uh, there is a, a Twitter feed that is similarly administered by my webmaster. Uh, so um, you can check check all that stuff out. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, guys. This has been a blast. Yeah. And and Mike, Mike, for God's sake, would you start aging, please? Yeah. This guy, this guy it's, hasn't it's, changed. Okay, maybe a little gray around the edges. But it's, the hemp. it's the hemp. <laughs> it's the hemp. It's the hemp. It's the hemp. It's the hemp socks. It's the hemp socks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I don't understand why I got old and fat and nobody else did. Damn it. Send him some hint, Mike. All right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs>